The station QRSA, the voice of the city, on the air, 24 hours daily. Wait a minute, wait a minute, give me a chance, folks. <laughs> you ain't heard nothing yet, you ain't heard a thing. Welcome back to another episode of Wild About Jolson. We have uh, Andrea. Hello. We have Vlad. Hello. And Andrew. Hi, everyone. And joining us today as a special guest, we have Ron Hutchinson from the Vitaphone Project. Hi, thanks for having me. Basically, the reason why we brought you on today was because you have quite a few connections to the Jolson world. And there's a very special piece of uh, Jolson history that would have been lost if, if it hadn't been for you and the Vitaphone Project, um, which is the uh, short film from 1926 called The Plantation Act. If you're a Jolson fan and you don't you don't know what that is, um, you're listening to the wrong podcast, I think. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Ron, why don't you just go ahead and start us off? Just tell us a little bit about the the Vitaphone Project and the history with it. Sure, yeah. Thanks, thanks very much for having me again. I really appreciate it. Uh, basically, back in 1991, I had the the idea, uh, being a longtime collector of 78s and also really loving old movies, especially the early talkie period, that wouldn't it be nice if we tried to do some kind of a search among record collectors who might have some of these 16-inch shellac soundtrack portions of early talkies. The Vitaphone Project, which was developed by Bell Labs in the early 20s and was really adopted by Warner Brothers as the only studio that had any interest in kind of taking a plunge into talking pictures, basically had the picture uh, and 35 millimeter film was one element. However, an entirely separate but synchronized portion was the sound portion, which was this big 16 inch shellac disc turning at three, three and a third. And there was a precise starting spot for both the picture and the projector and where the needle would go on the turntable and one motor on the projector drove both. And as long as the film didn't break or the needle didn't jump, everything actually did stay in synchronization. Uh, so it was my thought back in 91 that a number of collectors of records might have some of these soundtrack discs uh, that would then match otherwise mute film that was sitting primarily at the Library of Congress. In other words, the picture port, no sound though. And this is kind of almost pre-internet. So this was really word of mouth, articles I wrote in some collector publications, that kind of thing kind of spread the word. And, uh, you know, not expecting any kind of a big response. You know, we figured we might find a few dozen or maybe 100 or 200 or whatever. Well, as time went on and the internet kind of uh, enable us to, to have even more outreach. Uh, as of today, so our 25th anniversary of the project actually is uh, this year, uh, believe it or not, we have found worldwide in private hands over 6,000 of these soundtrack discs in private hands, and that's in addition to what are the various archives. And we've worked with Warner Brothers, UCLA, the Library of Congress, British Film Institute, and a lot of private collectors over the last 25 years and uh, uh, just over about 120 of these shorts, these 10-minute shorts that were made from 1926 to 30, which is the Act, and about a dozen features that were also done in the Vifon process have been restored, and many of them are actually out on DVD. So we started with this little idea that I didn't think was going to go very far, and uh, lo and behold, you know, uh, way over 100 films restored, 6,000 discs found and so on. And at the Library of Congress, there's still about 350 of these short films that they have the picture for, but are still seeking uh, the sound for. So that's kind of where we started back in 91. And uh, one of the holy grails when we first started, since two of the fellows that helped me start the project, David Goldenberg and one of the biggest Jolson collectors around, uh, John Newton, who some of you may know, um, one of the holy grails was to find Al Jolson's Plantation Act, a one reel short that he filmed in the early fall of 1926, a year before the jazz singer. And at the time we formed the Vitaphone Project, no picture was known and no sound was known. So it was pretty, you know, a pretty bleak uh, outlook. Uh, so, you know, that was one of the one of the goals, you know, our little wish list of things to try to find and restore. Uh, it looked kind of hopeless when we first started. Around what year did material from a plantation act start popping up? To my knowledge, it was the the film that showed up first. It had just had no sound to it. Was that correct? 
Yeah, well, pretty much, I mean, the irony is really, uh, Nigel, in the timing. So we started the project in the summer of 1991, had this on our wish list. And in 1993, uh, I get a call from uh, my friends at the Library of Congress, and they said, you know, Ron, we, what we just found, we had a film can that was marked Jazz Singer Trailer. And we decided that, you know, that's around. People had seen it before. And we just put it in the projector, and it wasn't the trailer for the Jazz Singer at all. It was the picture portion, no sound, for a plantation act. Wow. wow. <laughs> so, wow. you know, the, the uh, edict that they sent or what they wanted was, well, you know, could we now try to find the disc? Now, this is beyond trying to find a needle in a haystack. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the odds of finding the disc were like very remote. So that's 1993. And late that year or early the next, but it was within six or eight months after I got that call from Library of Congress, uh, we tracked down, believe it or not, in a barn in Towson, Maryland, uh, five discs that a, an old collector who used to work at Bell Laboratories had uh, had stored in his um, barn. And uh, John Newton uh, of the project went down there and made an arrangement with his widow. His widow um, um, knew about the discs, knew nothing much about them, so he negotiated and got the discs. And all of the discs, including the Plantation Act disc, were broken. And worse than that, because you can usually do something with that, they had been glued together with epoxy, which mm -hmm. is like, you know, such that if you imagine a record, the grooves didn't line up. So imagine this pie that is split into five V-shaped portions, glued back together with epoxy, and the grooves don't line up. Mm -hmm. So basically, at that point, it was unplayable. And so it was very, very frustrating. So, uh, you know, our, uh, I've certainly alerted the Library of Congress but the, the interesting thing was, all right, now what do we do with this thing? Because if you uh, try to separate it, you could damage the grooves and it would absolutely be permanently damaged. You could never do anything with it. So our project, since the project was really composed of a lot of old 78 RPM record collectors, we uh, contacted a fellow by the name of Jim Cooprider. And Jim is legendary in the record collecting community uh, in that, uh, you know, he can take a record that's in 50 pieces slight exaggeration, but not much, and actually put it together again and such that you can play it. So we got him the disc, and he mulled over for a couple of months, what am I going to do with this? How, how am I going to do this? Because you don't want to damage the, the top of the record where the groups are. So what he finally hit upon, through trial and error, was he put the disc, the 16-inch shellac disc with, the, with the, the epoxy holding it all together, uh, between two heavy plates of glass and put it in the sun. And he let it sit there for an hour and he would check to see if it was loosening up, softening up a little bit. Uh, if it wasn't, he'd put it out for a little longer. And eventually, through trial and error, he was able to soften the epoxy between each of these seams, slowly move the pieces back and forth, up and down, and separate them M miraculously with no damage. So he was able to clean that up and then eventually put, put the disc back together so that the grooves lined up um, and uh, use, you know, non-permanent glue. And then we got the disc back uh, in New Jersey, and uh, uh, one, of, one of our uh, co-founders, a fellow by the name of Sherwin Dunner, worked at the time for a company called Shanaki, uh, which does Yazoo Records, and they do a lot of reissues of 78s. So they had state-of-the-art equipment. And through trial and error... Uh, I was sitting there when we did it, uh, and t they had to tilt the turntable. They put a couple of quarters on the needle head <laughs> so it would crack. Uh, you, while you heard clicks, what you did hear, and we knew we were the first ones hearing the sound in, in 80 years because the film and sound had been missing since 1933. We knew we were the first ones hearing Jolson uh, talking to us, singing to us from uh, 1926. So we were able to get one complete pass, uh, digitized it, and then we got it out to UCLA and Robert get at the UCLA Film and Television Archive where they did some cleaning up. But imagine every time this, uh, this record turned, you had five clicks. So they were able to de-click it. And if you listen real close to the DVD version that's out there, you can kind of hear very faintly a couple of the clicks that, that snuck through. But generally, it's, uh, it was a miraculous, not only a miraculous find, but a miraculous restoration. Well, considering, you know, the history behind it, the audio that I hear, you know, on the DVD now, it doesn't sound any better or any worse than any other recording from that era, if 
Jolson fans here have the Jazz Singer DVD. I don't know if I mentioned that before, but Ron is actually one of the members of the group that does uh, the commentary track on the Jazz Singer DVD, along with uh, Vince Giordano, who I had the pleasure of meeting last summer when I went to New York City. So now I can officially say I've talked to both people who uh, <laughs> who were on the Jazz Singer commentary track. Doing a commentary track, that was the first time either Vince or I ever did that. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm kind of anal in terms of being prepared. So I had all these cheat sheets with little factoids and, you know, how much the movie made and, you know, how many theaters were open at the time, all these little factoids. And Vince was next to me as we're watching the DVD and doing the recording and the commentary. And uh, he didn't have anything. I said, he said, oh, my God, you know, what am, what am I going to say? I said, I'll just throw it to you every time there's something musical, which was many, many times. So it actually worked out. I, you know, I've known Vince for many years, so it, was, it worked out really well. Was mm -hmm. that just one long take that you guys did and whatever, whatever you said stuck? Or did you go back in and fix it up later? Well, uh, ironically, I mean, especially being the first time we did it, we went through, basically, we had a widescreen TV. We had uh, 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 somebody from Warner Brothers on the phone listening the whole time. Um, and we went all the way through one take. And then at the end, they just asked us a few questions. So they, if they had a few gaps that they wanted to plug back in earlier in the film, they could do that. But actually, you know, we went straight through from beginning to end. Cool one take yeah that's uh that's how you hope it happens every time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um did you guys have any questions yeah i had a question Go ron ahead. um your you mentioned that in the early 90s when you started the vitaphone project you had this uh huge list of things you wanted to restore find and restore the play al jolson in a plantation act being the holy grail mm -hmm. you said you've since you found thousands of um uh audio to our discs that uh, with audio on them and but there's still some remain that are missing that you're aware of correct Oh, many, yes. If you had to today make a list, a new list of um, priorities, which what would be which um, tracks would be near the top of the list that maybe would be today's holy grail, like the Plantation Act was in the '90s, or even if not to that degree, what 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 are your priorities now? Yeah. What, what's your wish list? Well, I mean, there are many, but I mean, there. First of all, one of the things we've learned uh, is that there were so many vaudeville acts that were totally forgotten. Nobody has a clue what they did or, or whether they were good or bad or whatever that we've since restored films of people have enjoyed them at the screenings and on DVD and so on. So of course there's a lot of names that mean nothing to anybody that might be gems, but I mean, one of them is uh, Jack Benny's very first film in 1928. Uh, sure. He did in Brooklyn. Um, uh, the sound exists for that, but no picture. There are a wealth of jazz uh, orchestras. There's an old girl orchestra called uh, Babe Egan and her Hollywood Redheads. I mean, the title alone makes you drool, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's a bunch of all black orchestras that did not have a lot of exposure in film otherwise that filmed in the, in the late 20s and so on. Um, there are some Technicolor uh, shorts that they did in 1929 with uh, Judy Garland uh, as part of the Gum Sisters. Um, she did three. Two of them are missing uh, the picture portion entirely, but the discs are around. And of course, if you think about being nine decades plus after the films um, were made, it, the better problem to have, uh, if one part is missing, it's better to be missing the disc because there's always a chance a yeah. shellac disc is going to turn up. The likelihood of nitrate film that's 90 years plus uh, gone uh, turning up is very, very slim. Right. So, uh, so uh, you know, but uh, there, as I said, there are about 320 shorts that Library of Congress has the picture portion only for, uh, that which means that as, as anybody reports a disc to me, which is certainly a monthly occurrence, um, I immediately check the list to see if it matches up um, with, with a, uh, you know, possible uh, picture portion that could therefore be restored. I find that start, that uh, fact fascinating that the uh, Plantation Act disc was mislabeled. Ha has there have there been other cases where things were not what you thought they'd be? You got a disc that maybe you thought was one thing because of a label, and then when you went to hear it or watch it, you saw that it's it was mislabeled. Or was that the that's like the classic case, and it's a it's a fascinating story. I wonder if that happened again. If that was kind of commonplace that things were mislabeled. Well, it's not. However, having said that, keep in mind that if you look at the archives throughout the world how much stuff is uncatalogued. So forget being mislabeled. 
not being labeled at all or not being on any database. Uh, I'm told, for example, in, in, in the Russian archive, which has many, many American shorts and, and features, um, that uh, you know that they don't do not have a really good, accurate listing of American titles for what they have. Um, somebody just happened to know, for example, that the Eddie Cantor uh, 1930 Technicolor musical Whoopi was there. Somebody just happened to remember that. But if you looked at their their listing and their cataloging, it wasn't there. Yeah. So the bigger issue, and it certainly even applies to some degree at the Library of Congress, everything isn't cataloged just because of the sheer volume of things to be cataloged and the shortage of uh, people to do it. So London After Midnight could be uh, sitting on a shelf somewhere, <laughs> and they're not even yeah. aware of it, really. I yeah. was thinking yeah. about that, Nigel, yeah. <laughs> and myself. Well, yeah. Well, people, I mean, people have been looking for a lot of the titles. Our, our Holy Grail, to kind of back to the, get back to the earlier question, which is a uh, 1933 Warner Brothers Vitaphone feature, actually by the early 30s, even Warner Brothers switched away from discs and went to sound on film like all the other studios, but they still use the Vitaphone name on the films. There's a 1933 all-star uh, Warner Brothers comedy, pre-code comedy called Convention City. And that's my own personal holy grail. It's set in Atlantic City. It's got Adolph Manju, Dick Powell, Joan Blondell, Guy Kibbe, Hugh Herbert. I mean, it's unbelievable, Warner Brothers cast. And uh, it was very risque, but it wasn't filthy. But there is no known copy anywhere on Earth. And that's been our personal holy grail to kind of find that. And it was an extremely popular film. It was released in many different languages. You know, there should have been hundreds, if not thousands of prints. And yet so far, uh, you know, it has not turned up. However, if we go back to um, two films that we recently helped find, or relatively recently helped find, Colleen Moore, who was one of the biggest silent stars, I think she was paid $12,500 a week in her heyday, worked for First National, uh, which also used the Vitaphone process. And her last two features, Synthetic Sin and Why Be Good, were both considered lost films. The only previously known prints had gone up in a fire at Warner Brothers uh, many decades ago. And when I was at uh, Film Forum uh, in 2002 introducing one of my Vitaphone short shows, I usually brought people up to date on recent discoveries. And I just casually mentioned that I'd recently acquired the soundtrack disc for her last silent. So it was called uh, Why Be Good? And it had really hot uh, 20s dance music and sound effects, no dialogue. And I said, you know, I just found these discs, just acquired them. And I said in front of the audience at Film Forum in New York, I said, it's unfortunate that this is a lost film. And from the back of the theater, a fella, Joe Ransky, who's a big uh, film uh, historian himself, yells, I know where it is. <laughs> wow. And he did. And it turned out that the two films that were thought lost had just been sitting uh, in an Italian archive, uh, deposited there in the late 20s. And a few collectors knew about it, but it was not general knowledge. And then uh, fast forward to two or three years ago, Warner Brothers got it, used my discs to restore it. And it's on DVD. And it's one of the most enjoyable late silence with music and sound effects you could ever ever see and it uses vitaphone discs is that part of the warner archive dvd set yes it's warner archive has why be good out on dvd synthetic sin which she made just before that which was also a silent with a vitaphone track only the last disc survives okay. so far i always say so far because you know you always hope you'll find stuff so until we either have uh, vince giordano uh, recreate the soundtrack or we find the discs, that probably won't be out on DVD for a while. Um, I have two questions, but I'll let anybody else that has one they've been waiting for to go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have one, if I, if I may. Sure. Um, uh, Jens and I, I mean, Jens is the guy who's been working with me on this uh, Jolson documentary on the road to Jolson, which still has to be completed. Uh, Jens and I uh, attended uh, the 2007 uh, Jessinger screening in Los Angeles and also the uh, Plantation Egg was uh, shown and you talked about, you know, how you discovered the disc and restored it and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering... In what context uh, the plantation egg was originally shown? And uh, I remember very well the audience reaction there in 2007 in Los Angeles, which was magical. I mean, it was like Jolson was there on stage and, and people were reacting to 
to uh, Jolson's, you know, rhetoric questions and everything. And I was wondering, yeah, first, what in what context it was uh, shown originally, and if there are any accounts of the reactions of audiences of 1920, uh, 26. Yeah. Um, well, what happened was uh, when Warner Brothers decided to take the plunge into sound films, it was initially not for talking. Uh, it was to provide smaller theaters with a full symphonic score, maybe a little sound effect here and there, but they really were not primarily interested in presenting talking pictures, per se. And uh, their first film that was released in Vitaphone was uh, Don Juan in 1926. However, mm -hmm. it was preceded by a small group of about uh, six or eight shorts that were talking. So you had a banjo player, you had Will Hayes from the Producers Association speaking to the audience. And lo and behold, that is what was the hit. The shorts where people were talking, people were singing, opera stars, and so on. So uh, after that, the, the light bulb went on in the Warner Brothers' minds. And for their second program, which was with a Sid Chaplin feature called The Better Ole, they decided to have some more popular shorts accompany that film or precede that film. So they had some operatic and some other things, but they had more popular fears. So they had a comedy team by the name of William Eugene Howard, who did Jewish humor. You had George Jessel. So this is still, this is still a year before the jazz singer. And um, you also had Al Jolson and the Plantation Act. Uh, and this is, I think, um, I, I guess it's like around October or so of uh, 1926. Um, uh, maybe a month later. Jolson, by the way, was paid $25,000 to make this eight-minute short. So uh -huh. he, he did uh -huh. all so, um, so the So first of all, the reaction was was magical, as it is today. It's really it's possibly his best film appearance because it's so natural, so unfamiliar, yeah. and so uh, intimate, I think. And uh, so it went over phenomenally well. However, I think it figured into the Warner Brothers decision uh, to use Jolson in the Jazz Singer, even though Jessel had been announced in the press as being in the Jazz Singer uh, the following year, uh, I think you know the Warner Brothers clearly saw the audience reaction to the Jolson short, especially on the same program that you had George Jessel. George Jessel was on the you know on the same within minutes of the Jolson um, uh, short being shown, so there was a perfect context to compare the two. And, um, you know, Jolson uh, did his act, but he was preceded by Jessel doing his, tel um, you know, on the telephone with his mama act. And my guess is there wasn't a heck of a lot of comparison, <laughs> you know, a heck of a lot of decision making. So this idea that Jessel turned down the jazz singer because uh, uh, he wanted some more money to speak and sing, uh, you know, there's no real credibility in that. I, the decision was entirely Warner Brothers, especially after seeing J J Jolson and the jazz singer saying, look, if we're going to go all in on talking pictures, we need the biggest star we can possibly get. And we, we've just seen what the audience reaction is to him. I know that Ronald. you said in the uh, commentary track for the jazz singer that uh, promotional materials do exist that say George Jessel and the jazz singer coming soon. So. Uh, it, it wasn't a. Uh, it was sort of a real quick decision that was made to switch from him to Jolson. I assume. Yeah, yeah. I have the poster actually. Uh, I know I put it up on our Vitaphone project uh, Facebook page, and it's a one sheet, and it's all words, but it just talks about different films that are coming. They even uh, announced Noah's Ark, which didn't come out for another three years. So this is probably January of 1927. So a month or two after. Plantation Act, but well before they started firming things up to actually put together the, the cast for Jazz Singer. And it's clear as day. It says uh, George Jessel in the Jazz Singer, which, of course, he, he performed on Broadway. So, you know, that was the first natural, um, you know, assumption as to who would star in a film. And Jessel was already under contract doing some silence for Warner Brothers at the time. Um, but, I mean, that changed very fast, certainly by, I guess, maybe by the end of March, or so you guys may know better than I, uh, the decision was made to shift it over to Jolson. Uh, hi, Ron. Uh, this is uh, Vlad Petrio. Hi, I, I looked at your page, and, you know, I, I, I grew up in New York City, and I was an Uncle Floyd fan, and I, I have... <laughs> And I lived in New Jersey in the late 80s, and I have a vague recollection of that little battle that, that, that is retold. Of. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> get, get back to the... 
to the topic at hand. One thing that I find fascinating is the stories, and I think it's in one of the Jolson biographies, about Warner Brothers, and I don't know if this is true, which is why I'm bringing this up. I'd like to hear your uh, thoughts on it. The Warner Brothers ordered all copies of the Plantation Act to be destroyed. Is, is there any truth to that? And if there is, what, what, what is the story behind it? Or or did it just disappear because all these extra copies were made for movie theaters? I suppose they, after the film was run, they would be returned to the studio, and which wouldn't keep all of them. Exactly. What, how would these films that were, that, be, that were mailed out or, or shipped out to the movie theaters once the run was over with, what happened to all those copies? Okay. Why aren't there, why aren't there more copies of, of, of Plantation Act and, and all these other films, given how many copies had to have been made to be shown you know, across country at all the theaters? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, that probably for the Plantation Act, initially, there were probably, uh, you know, maybe 200 to 300 copies total. It was still being offered to theaters uh, as late as 1929, but as you can imagine, um, you know, even then it looked uh, very, very dated, uh, even though it was just a three-year elapse. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very straightforward uh, film, and it, it, it would look old in 1929. So it was still in the Vitaphone Shorts catalog of 1929, so it was still available then. And when we were doing research on the Plantation Act, we did find some correspondence from the Warner Brothers Archive that indicated that in 1933, there was some kind of a lawsuit from a songwriter who was claiming uh, some song that he wrote was used in the film. And of course, we know the songs that were used in the film, and none of them were written by this guy. I forget the guy's name. And the memo back to the guy said, uh, you know, we no longer have a copy of the film which is possible because it was not going to be circulated anymore. It was considered old and dated and was not going to be released by Warner Brothers. So very often what would happen is all the prints would go back to the studio uh, of any film. They would tend to keep one or two and then just destroy the rest. And that was just normal because they didn't have endless uh, supplies because every feature probably had three or 400 prints so they couldn't keep everything. Um, so per Warner Brothers, it looks like I certainly, I don't think that they threw it out. They could have just been telling the songwriter, you know, this, and it wasn't really true. Um, but as far as we can tell, Warner Brothers was at least claiming in 1933 that they did not know of any prints around and uh, were using that to deny the songwriter, you know, any, any rights. And you had, uh, you know, the songs that are in there are in Berlin. I mean, you know, these are not, this is not some small-time songwriter's uh, songs in the, in the short. Now, how did a Plantation Act record end up in a barn? I mean, I mean, not that you know the, the entire history of it, but how could that perceivably happen? Well, in this particular case, which is the exception rather than the rule, this fella um, um, worked for Bell Laboratories. And so it's certainly possible since he, you know, he was, he was probably in his 80s when he died. So my guess is he was around the Bell Laboratories when they were experimenting with discs, had the stampers, might have had extra copies and so on. So it's our theory, and we don't know because the fellow died before we, we got to the, the widow to get the disc, that, you know, he may have just acquired them, um, you know, from Bell Labs. However, there, keep in mind, we found over 6,000 discs that someone either had a relative who worked at the movie theater and they just took some discs home from the theater. They were supposed to return to Warner Brothers, but many didn't. Um, many of them just got, you know, uh, thrown out and, and record collectors acquired them and so on. Um, so, you know, there's all kinds of stories as to, uh, you know, how, how these discs turned up. But in this particular case, this was an actual Bell Labs employee. And it was very frustrating because when we found the guy's name, uh, we couldn't call the widow because she didn't have a phone. So we had to use those old uh, white pages CDs that you used to be able to buy before you could do everything online. And we found her next door neighbor, called the neighbor and asked, could you knock on Mrs. So-and-so's door and, and, and ask her to get on the phone? So that was <laughs> very circuitous. <really. laughs> yeah, that makes me uh, think that it's possible that some of these discs are sitting in attics all over the country, all over the world. And maybe the original owners have passed away and no one knows now that they're there. I just get this terrible vision of some young heir to the estate going up into the attic and saying, oh, look at grandpa's old record collection and then just like tossing it or something that's oh, a scary thought isn't it? but, <laughs> well, but it's possible, it's scary, right? 
I would say where we are today. Now, I, keep in mind, a typical year, I probably hear about, I'd say, three or 400 discs, new discs we didn't know about. Last year, I heard from somebody in Chicago, they just bought an old house. They found one disc in the attic, didn't know where it came from. Obviously, it was the previous owner. And then here's the good part. They saw it said Vitaphone. They went on the Internet, and our website is one of the first you will find when you uh, Google Vitaphone. So, I, in fact, I think we're probably in better shape today than, say, 25 years ago in that people tend to think, you know, some old stuff has some value or importance, and at least they have a way of finding me. So, uh, right. so that it happens, I think, a little more often that we do here than, yeah. than people chuck it out. And that just stresses the importance of getting the word out about the Vitaphone project to more and more people so that people come across these discs, they'll, it'll, it'll strike them, okay, this might have some value. And I seem to remember someone that's looking for these. So it's kind of stresses the importance of really spreading the word. Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the wonderful thing about, about the, the Internet is that now if you find a single copy of something as rare as a plantation act and you manage to save it, you can, you know, Put it online as it's on many. Well, it's been uploaded to YouTube by many different people. I just watched it before today, and the whole world can see it. So the possibilities of, of reintroducing the. I mean, of course, Joseph is so well known, but reintroducing even the 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 art of some of the lesser known, let's say, the vaudevillians that you mentioned yeah. earlier. Yeah. It, it's it's incredible. It's it's almost like being able to resurrect. You know something that's been that's been gone and and long forgotten. Yeah, so, and in it, fact, uh, it's uh, I think you know though you mentioned the vaudeville shorts, which uh, um, Vitaphone was producing either on the West Coast or in the Brooklyn studios, um, two or three shorts a week for about five years. And as far as the vaudevillians are concerned, you know I grew up reading all about. Uh, different vaudevillians, and you know it's it's very different to read about them and then to see them performing their acts. And vaudeville, uh, as as you see it recreated on Vitaphone, were, were basically straight filmings of people's acts. So Burns and Allen, in 1929, their short, which has been restored, is a precise filming of their act, and that's what a lot of these vaudevillians, most of whom are totally forgotten today, um, uh, uh, did for Vitaphone. And, um, you know, that's been one of the really exciting parts of the project, which was really unanticipated when we first started the project. And that is not only restoring and rediscovering these wonderful, especially the comedy uh, vaudeville uh, shorts, but then tracking down the relatives, the sons and daughters and grandkids of the performers and sitting in the audience with them to see a huge audience laughing and clapping at their relatives, wow. you know, 80, 90 years later. Uh, the very first short we were involved with restoring back in 1992 uh, was Baby Rosemary, The Child Wonder. And many of you may know Rosemary from The Dick Van Dyke Show, Hollywood Squares. Uh, in 1929, she was a, a child star, sang like an adult with an adult voice, even though she was seven, and she made a short in 1929. And... Uh, I, I was lucky enough to sit next to her at UCLA when it was restored and rescreened, and everybody was watching this little girl in black and white on the screen singing her heart out, and then it was like watching a tennis match, and all the heads would then go to her in the audience, and then back and forth and back and forth. So it was a rare opportunity to actually sit with a Vitaphone star, you know, 70, 80 years later, uh, while she watched herself on the big screen. That's awesome. Ron, what was it like to see uh, the Plantation Act played with sound and picture for the first time? Well, first of all, you know, we had heard the disc, obviously, when we did the first transfer. But, I mean, it, that's half of the performance, let's face it. Um, so, I mean, uh, I was lucky enough to see it at UCLA with an audience of about three or 400 people. And, you know, people, first of all, applauded after each song. They laughed at the jokes, you know, about John McCormick being the, the original yep. Matthew singer and all yep. that kind of stuff. I mean, it was like a real life performance. It was not like watching a film. There was people were sighing and, you know, ooing and eyeing. You just couldn't believe it. And then, of course, the big clincher is at the end when he comes out for what is it, three uh, yeah. curtain calls and everything. People are just laughing their heads off like, how did he know in 1926 that we were still applauding? 
Yeah. Well, he knew. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, this one about uh, the jazz singer. When the jazz singer was restored for DVD, um, you guys went back and synced it up with the original Vitaphone uh, records. Were all previous copies of the jazz singer that were on Laserdisc and VHS, they were all taken from a sound transfer print. Is that correct? Correct. The uh, jazz singer was re-released by Warner Brothers, I'm going to say probably like 1931, 32 um, and that was sound on film uh, transfer that they did. And of course, the technology to do that from the discs then versus now was you know night and day. So what happened was for the jazz singer restoration, which was really the the brainchild of uh, the senior vice president of Warner Archive, George Feltenstein. Uh, this this guy ought to get sainthood. He's just like a phenomenal supporter of film restoration and getting it out to to people to see again. Uh, we actually transferred John Newton's original Vitaphone discs, which were in beautiful shape here at my house, and they went to that. So you had, frankly, much, much better sound directly from those beautifully recorded Western Electric Vitaphone discs, uh, much better. Um, and then it did, did some additional cleaning up, but not a lot. Um, and much better than certainly the sound on film re-released at the VHS and the DVD uh, and so on were were derived from. So those those uh, jazz singer Vitaphone discs, those had been kept uh, in, in obviously pretty good shape through the last eighty years. Yeah, and interestingly, uh, there are many many sets of jazz singer discs that survive. For the very first showings of uh, jazz singer, which was only in a I don't know how many theaters were originally, but you know it was under two hundred or two two hundred and fifty. Um, basically, instead of having one Vitaphone disc per reel of film, which was normally the case, since this was the first feature that was going to have sound portions in different parts of the, the running time of the feature, what they had was, believe it or not, 24 or 25 separate discs. So what you would have is if you had the scene where there's no talking, there's just some music and sound effects, that was one disc. And, and, and this is only for the initial run. And then what they decided to do, do was, for whatever reason, as soon as there's actual speaking or singing, something synchronized to lips, uh, they would switch over to the other projector and another disc, and they'd do that. And they went back and forth. And you can imagine uh, the projectionist losing weight, you know, sweating his head off, going back and forth between the two projectors and so on. That sounds like very, a nightmare. Very cumbersome. That sounds like a night. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, for those who don't know, we had a hard time connecting uh, over Skype, all four of us together. And that took about 15 <laughs> minutes to get right. And uh, I was sweating bullets over here because I was stressed out about it. I can only imagine what it would have been like to run yeah. back and forth from different projectors and try to try to sync all this stuff up. And I mean, obviously in the movie, this, the movie Singing in the Rain pretty much gets it pretty spot on uh, oh, yeah. as far as what can go wrong when uh, the synchronization was was out of alignment. So, but anyway, it was obvious even to them that this was nuts. This is no, you know, we can't operate like this. So what they did was the discs, the 16 inch discs were created one disc per reel of film, which is about 10 minutes. And what they did was they put all the sound for that reel, combining the various discs onto each disc. So in other words, you have reel one, disc one, reel two, disc two. And it would just switch from one projector to the other as you change the reels, but not every time you went from music to speaking and vice versa. Um, now, obviously they realized pretty quickly that they couldn't, they couldn't do the, this process forever. Um, was the singing fool done on, on the, by the same method? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, keep in mind, you know, when, when sound came in um, uh, successfully, I mean, there were attempts at, at talking pictures, hundreds of attempts from the 1890s right through the early 20s. And, and all of them failed for a couple of reasons. One, how do you synchronize the picture and sound? How do you record the sound so it sounds real? Because they always used acoustic or horn recording techniques. And then the other big problem, how do you fill a theater with sound? But fortunately, by the early 20s, Bell Laboratories had perfected the loudspeaker, the microphone, and came up with the mechanical way to synchronize the disc and the picture. But they also came up at the same time with sound on film. So while a lot of people think that Vitaphone preceded sound on film and uh, just got you know pushed out of the way because it was cumbersome, actually they were kind of 
simultaneously developed and rolled out in the mid 20s. The the the, uh, um, the sound on film system was called Movie Tone, Fox Movie Tone, and for quite a while, certainly through 1930, the sound quality from Vitaphone discs was tremendously superior to the sound on film. And if you see an old sound on film picture and then you watch the Singing Fool, the, the sound quality on Singing Fool is is much, much better than the sound on film. Uh, however, there were a lot of limitations to Vitaphone. First of all, you had to ship tens of thousands of discs in duplicate. It did it all over the world. Um, they could break. It cost money to press them. Uh, you couldn't really shoot outside easily. Editing was a real nightmare because usually you had to do one continuous take for the whole reel. They eventually got a little sophistication in, in editing that. So by early 1930, even Warner Brothers recognized sound had improved on, on sound on film systems. And, you know, it's, it was time even for them to drop recording directly to disc. So, but, but all of the Jolson features were recorded and released in the Vitaphone disc system. So, you know, right through Big Boy and, um, uh, you know, Mammy and so on. Um, and um, uh, they would release it also though, in sound on film to those theaters that could show that. And they would just transfer the discs to sound on film. Do all those discs still exist too in one form or another? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything missing. Uh, Andrea and I were back and forth uh, a week or two ago about, um, uh, it was Big Boy, right, Andrea? Yeah, yes, right. Yeah, that, uh, you know, how there are, I think there are eight known surviving discs, and the, the, you could get 10 minutes on a disc, but that doesn't mean you use 10 minutes. You could have used seven minutes or eight minutes or whatever. Right. So we were wondering if there's some sound on discs that isn't known out there, and as far as we could tell, that's not the case. But all of the, all of the Jolson discs, um, I think partly because the films uh, had strong re-release value uh, beyond your initial runs uh, do survive. That's like, um, what, the Spaniard that blighted my life? The the scene was, was cut out of uh, The Singing Fool for legal reasons, but it's still, the audio still remained on the Vitaphone disc. That's correct, yep. And uh, so we're lucky to even have that that audio that exists thanks to the, the Vitaphone process. Um, yep. I'll go ahead and let somebody else ask a question because I feel like I'm monopolizing things here. <laughs> Well, I, I have one, but which might be a, a wide stretch or far stretch, <laughs> whatever it's called. Um, I, I wrote an article about El Jolson in a German uh, academic <clears throat> publication uh, two years ago or so, and I stumbled upon uh, uh, something political. And maybe Ron, you know something about that? Maybe it's it's just a coincidence or not? Maybe it wasn't intended. I don't know. Which is the uh, Plantation Act of 1740, this this uh, naturalization act, I mean, a, a law by the British Parliament for the American colon colonies to um, naturalize um, foreign Protestants into the American colonies, I, I believe. And there were exceptions, not just pro Protestants, but also, I think, Quakers and Jews. So I was wondering if, uh, since Jolson is a Jew performing in blackface, you know, in a plantation act, if that was a coincidence or if that was uh, intentional to choose that kind of title, which, you know, has this connection. Well, my, to... my guess, Andrew, is I think it's just, it's pure coincidence. I, I, my yeah, suspicion too bad. is that, <laughs> yeah, it would be make a nice story, but I think, yeah. you know, <clears throat> just uh, a lot of the titles of the films were, uh, you know, John Doe in... Uh, writing a letter to mom or something, you know, so right. in other words, had the, the performer's name in, that was the actual title. So it was Al Jolson and the Plantation Act was, was how um, the original titles, which, which are actually not on the short. I mean, those were recreated. I think you can kind of tell that. So I, I think that was just a coincidence. I don't think there was any, any political thought uh, given yeah. by the Warren Brothers. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to, if I could, uh, just uh, turn the discussion for a minute towards the, the actual substance of the film itself, a, a plantation act, and why I think it's uh, such a, an incredibly wonderful piece of history that, that, that you helped to, to save. It's not even preserved. I mean, it's saved. Nobody would have even known if you hadn't yeah. got and and you know made the effort you did to, to discover the film to, to match the film's disc. Yes. Uh, of course, in 1926, Jolson was the king of Broadway, the most popular song star and chart, you know, song chart leader in the 1920s in the country. I mean, on on a level that today, uh, I don't uh, I don't even think there's anybody today who's even a close approximation in terms of how big of a star he was. 
uh, in the 1920s. I mean, that's for a lot of other reasons. But when I first saw this film, uh, and it was off of, obviously, the, the jazz singer 70th anniversary uh, DVD, uh, I was, I mean, I had the same reaction as the audience reaction you described, you know, when you first screened, screened the, the restored print. I mean, it was, you know, kind of got chills going up my back. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and the thing that struck me immediately was how different uh, this performance was from, to me, from all of the other Jolson performances for his later films that I saw. Uh, for one thing, he didn't. He was completely relaxed. I mean, in, in a plantation act, to me, he's completely relaxed. He is in complete command of, you know, of the scene. I mean, he's on a he's on a Broadway stage. He doesn't seem to be trying to add anything extra, which I think, I don't know if that was intentional or if it was just kind of the way that they thought that sound films should should be done later on but it always seems to me that he's he's trying to put some extra ad energy into his performances in his later movies uh, but that is doesn't appear to be the case here he's just completely relaxed completely natural and, and the way that he's bantering with it with the, with the camera mm -hmm. like you would with an audience on Broadway I thought it was just absolutely uh, fantastic there's a he's he's more personable in a way than perhaps in some of the later on more stylized performances of the later Warner Brothers pictures. And I was wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah, uh, well, actually, uh, when you mentioned about, you know, the relationship with the audience in this film versus, uh, you know, his features later on, one of the things we were able to find was that in the original contract for $25,000 to do the one short, it says something to the effect that, uh, Mr. Jolson shall sing and speak. So, in other words, this idea that it was ad lib. They knew, you know, Al Jolson was a singing and speaking performer. I mean, he didn't just sing. He inter inter uh, uh, connected with the audience, obviously, and uh, you know, all the little banter he has between the songs and so on, which makes the, the film so ingratiating. They wanted that. So in other words, that and, the, and later on in the, in the jazz singer, we said the piano, which was, you know, it was largely ad-libbed, obviously. That's in this contract. <coughs> so it's not a case of they just wanted a singer and that was the end of it. But I agree with you. I mean, it's really like probably like one of his, his Sunday benefit performances would have been where he's really connecting with the audience. I mean, keep in mind, this technology must have been very scary. You had him sitting, performing in front of this huge soundproof box that had a little window that the um, uh, movie camera pointed out of because they had to keep the sound of the camera away from the microphone. Extremely high light, hot lights, uh, very unnatural surroundings, and yet the performance is, is probably as close to, um, you know, I, I met a few people who were up in years who saw Jolson perform live, and they said, that's as close as you get to what Jolson was like when you were sitting in an actual audience watching him. Well, what's Ron, uh, something that uh, Vlad just mentioned about how, how Jolson seems more natural in Plantation Act versus any of his feature films. Plantation Act was pretty much filmed in, in one shot, you know, and he wasn't playing anybody else. He was playing him. He was playing himself. He didn't have to be, you know, right. Joe Lane or, or Jack, Jack Robin, he, you know, he, yeah. he was just allowed to be himself up there on stage. And I think mm -hmm. that that says a lot about Jolson, his personality. Yeah. He can really, really play himself, you know. And when you, you yeah. try to force him into these other roles, it, it obviously on film it doesn't turn out as well as it does when you just let Jolson do what's natural to him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and I want to, if I can add to that, I, like um, what Ron said a few minutes ago, and also what Nigel just said, he was playing himself. Yes, he was also playing Gus, which is the character that he played yeah, so many exactly. times, countless times on Broadway, and he was. He was most right. him, he was most himself when he was Gus, and he was Gus basically. And when I say Gus, Gus is an extension of himself. It's it's mm -hmm. it's, it's Al Jolson, and he was playing that character in uh, Al Jolson and the Plantation Act. And like Ron alluded to earlier, he wasn't just a singer, Al Jolson. Yes, he made a huge career with his uh, recordings on uh, on Brunswick and and later Decca, and of course earlier Victor in Columbia. But he was billed in the twenties. And Vlad alluded to his huge success in the twenties. He was billed as not just a singer but also a comedian. He right. wasn't he wasn't looked at as an actor until after the his movie career started. So there would have been no during in nineteen twenty six when Jolson was you know paid well to make this short. He wasn't 
even considered to be an actor. He was an entertainer, a comedian, yeah. and a singer, and that's exactly what he did best. Later on, we talk, even we Jolson fanatics kind of sometimes talk about his forced performances on, on film. But I think that's due to the fact that by nature he wasn't an actor. He did turn out some decent performances, and he wasn't a terrible actor, but he was a, a, an entertainer, and the subheading under entertainer to me is singer comedian and that's that's why i think plantation act comes across so real is because he was doing what he did he did a lot of things great but that's what he did best just to piggyback on, on what andrew just said um one of the other gems and i believe it's on the it's on the same jazz singer you know extended disc is, is that uh, technicolor short from the mid 30s uh, with uh, sybil jason a lot of the Warner Brothers big stars make cameo appearances, and when Jolson and Ruby Keeler make their cameo appearance, the announcer introduces Jolson as the com- the comedian Al Jolson, which I when I first saw it kind of yeah it focused on me exactly the point that Andrew made is that that's really how he was how he was uh, how he was seen, and then of course he he tells Ruby the famous joke that he must have loved. Somebody must have loved it because he did it three times in three <laughs> different movies. <laughs> about the... Uh, about the Hattress. You know, the, uh, the Hattress and the racetrack. And, and, uh, exactly, but he changes the punchline to Sombrero, which which uh, I, which is lucky for me because I use that in my Will Jolson act that I do for the veterans. Was, I don't, was it filmed at Caliente? Maybe it was filmed at the uh, Mexican it, That's Yeah, I think it was. I think it was a day at Santa Anita. That's it. That's actually, I got to meet Sybil Jason actually when, when I was out there for uh, the show that Andrea was at in 2007. And, of course, her memory is from filming The Singing Kid uh, with him. And she, she just loved him. And, uh, you know, I mean, she's, she had a couple of uh, bios that she wrote, or biographies that she wrote about, you know, how generous he was to her and, and so on. And, you know, of all the Jolson Warner Brothers features, that's my personal favorite because I think he by then he was so relaxed. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it was a little slicker than some of the other ones and so on. But um, uh, I, I particularly like uh, Singing Kid because I think you get at least more of the natural, more relaxed Jolson by that point. A couple questions about the jazz singer uh, restoration. When you were doing uh, that, the restoration for the DVD, the new transfers, did you come across any issues uh, with, with syncing them up? or And not only that, but the introduction, the overture. Was that something that had always been around that you knew about that wasn't included until later on, or was that uh, yeah, was that new to you? Yeah. Well, this was uh, has had been around. It just had not been used on any of the previous uh, issues. There, the, uh, there. Were, while I think on the initial DVD release, um, there were there was an issue that was a purely technical one on the part of uh, uh, the studio and one scene. I didn't even notice it. A couple of people pointed it out, and that was subsequently corrected on the Blu-ray. One of the interesting things that we had to play with was, if you remember it in the first reels of uh, the jazz singer, keep in mind, this is the first multi-reel feature that had sound all the way through. And you recall that there's a couple of scenes like in Coffee Dance where the clapping seems to go on and on and on and so on. And somebody thought that there was an error there that they somebody left it go too far. That's how it was when it first came out. So in other words, it's like, a, if you recall, it, it looks like the scene duplicates a couple of times. Yeah. That's how, yeah. Actually, yeah. that's how it actually is, because they were really just starting to get their hands around. How do you do a real change? I mean, up to then, all they had as far as actually synchronized films were one reel shorts. And that was it. There were a couple of attempts to do two reel shorts uh, that came out a little bit before The Jazz Singer. But this was, I mean, to go eight reels... Um, and, you know, to do those transitions, um, because you were switching in the theater from one projector to the other, one disc to the other, and they deliberately had some, a little bit of overlap. And it's pretty pronounced at the end of the, uh, um, the coffee dance scene where the clapping seems to go on and on. And that's not an error. That's something you would normally have seen just cut out or was cut out in the uh, VHS and the uh, Laserdisc versions that have been out before or would have been circulated on the reissue in the 30s. I don't mind that stuff because it really goes to show you the uh, the process and their mindset in uh, 1927. I'd rather have it how it originally was than to have somebody go in in you know 2016 and decide, oh, well, we can cut this and cut that part out now. It looks awkward. You know, I'd rather have it how it was originally intended. Yeah, yeah. You know, every time I go to uh, Disney World, I look around and all I can think of is, without the jazz singer, 
and the the sound revolution that came in 1927, there probably would have been no Steamboat Willie, and there probably would have been no Disney. Uh, so I saw a plaque online that was awarded uh, by Disney to Al Jolson for uh, revolutionizing the sound era on film. I don't know if anybody else has seen that, but um, no, but that's fascinating. Uh, I'll try to pull it up. I'll try to pull it up. I don't know what year it's from, but, you know, you just think about how important the Plantation Act and the jazz singer was to the rest of uh, the, you know, the 5.1 surround sound that we go see now when we go see, you know, a Star Wars movie or whatever. If it wasn't for the jazz singer, it could be a whole completely different landscape. I mean, I know eventually sound on film would have would have come out eventually at some point in another way. You know, it it all goes back to, to Warner Brothers and that risk that they took with the jazz singer. Yeah, and and you know, I think why did it, why did this sound finally succeed in the mid twenties when the countless efforts to to bring sound to pictures from say in eighteen ninety three all the way up to nineteen twenty, every single one of them failed, and some of it was were the technical things I talked about about the sound recording and synchronization and then filling the theater with sound. But the, the extra factor the Warner Brothers had, and they, I mean, they were great showmen, so they were very wise to switch from Jessel to Jolson, was Jolson. Mm-hmm. I mean, having him and they, that electrifying performance first in the Plantation Act, which relatively few people saw because there were relatively few theaters wired for sound at that time nationally, but certainly more saw uh, the jazz singer on its first release and then very often when theaters opened up wired for sound that showed that as their first film. It was really the Jolson factor that let everything else gel. It kind of melded the technology that was finally all there with the showmanship and the performance of, of uh, the world's greatest entertainer at the time. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's fascinating for me as a German because uh, I found out about Al Jolson in 2005. I heard about it for the first time then because of a film professor here. And I've, you know, attended, of course, several, several seminars and, and stuff about film history here in Germany. And... And there was not a single professor who really acknowledged Jolson's influence on the whole development of uh, talking pictures and everything. They all said that, yeah, that was a successful film, but it did not make the big change. You know, they they see other films or or experiences before that or after. So no, none of them really regards Jolson as the the you know the climax or the 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 um, the key to to that kind of change. Yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> I mean, in a bad way. It's deflecting is what it is, right? Yeah. yeah. But, but I agree with Nigel in that we don't really associate Jolson with... There are certain genres that we would never associate Jolson with, but yet, because of his breakthrough in 27 with the jazz singer, it did open doors for everything. Joel, uh, Nigel cites Steamboat Willie, which was the first talking animated short. Now, Jolson has nothing to do with animation, but yet, yes, it was Jolson's uh, work in The Jazz Singer, along with Warner Brothers, obviously, Vitaphone, that opened that door. And then that door, the Steamboat Willie short, opened the door later for less than 10 years later, a feature animated film, fully sound, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So, yeah, I think you can trace back a lot of that success if you really want to, you know, piece by piece, bring it back to its uh, roots. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll just I'll just mildly disagree with Andrew there, uh, there uh, when he says that you know Joseph didn't have anything to do with animated films. Well, that's true. He didn't personally, but it, it's a measure of seeing how big Joseph was as a star in the 20s and the 30s. If you notice all of the myriad, and I'm sure all of us here who've loved and grown up watching Warner Brothers and and uh, all the Disney and all the other uh, cartoon shorts from the 20s and, and 30s, how many references there are. Uh, to to Jolson, and I'm not uh, yeah. just talking about the obvious famous uh, cartoon that even my kids, who before that ever heard of Jolson, they knew uh, Owl Jolson from the, yeah. the cartoon <laughs> that was made after the Singing Kid came out. But in, in the very first color uh, cartoon sequence, which is from uh, Paul Whiteman's The King of Jazz, uh, the lion, who is ironically voiced by Bing Crosby, uh, at one point, you know, when he when he's about to roar, he pounds his chest and he comes out with "Mammy." <laughs> All, right. All right, more evidence of Jolson's amazing influence of the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Well, also, I think if if you put the the short and then jazz singer in context. So 1927, the Warner Brothers are all in on sound. They're wiring hundreds and then thousands of theaters. Keep in mind the other studios, other than Fox, which had movie tone sound on film, but other than Fox and Warner Brothers, all the other studios, MGM, 
Paramount, Universal, Columbia, banded together. And, and uh, basically, they said in very, very early 1928, shortly after the jazz singer came out, none of us will go into sound unless all of us will. So in other words, they were really still strongly, vigorously resisting switching to sound all these major studios and then what happened was then when the singing fool came out and made you know monumental amounts of money it was obvious to the studios that they could hold back no longer so you could say that warner brothers going through putting all their silence with sound music and sound effects and so on and starting to make more and more shorts and, and features with talking in it they were running away with with the business and this the other studios you know couldn't resist anymore so everything that happened after the mgm and the other studios said you know what we give up we've got to wire the studios for sound we got to get into sound full force that's why you had steamboat willie if if sound just failed you know you wouldn't have any of that kind of stuff so it was obvious that the warner brothers were really ahead of the curve uh were making incredible amounts of money and the other studios who kind of stonewalled talkies for as long as they could, couldn't resist anymore. And they had, they had to go in or feel. If they didn't get into sound, they were going to go out of business. Yeah, and it's ironic because from what I've read, the Warner Brothers had a lot of financial problems. And, uh, you know, perhaps, I don't know if it's true, was, you know, in danger of failing itself, which, uh, I, as, I, as I've read, and you can correct me if this is wrong, my impression was always that one of the reasons why they took the risk to do this uh, and uh, and go into sound and and uh, you know have Jolson obviously as the biggest star was the logical choice was because they needed to do something to you know to to restore the financial stability of their studio. Is well, that actually, actually, you know, they, uh, there are a lot of stories that kind of paint the Warner Brothers as a uh, you know really low level studio that was about to fail, and that turns out not to really be true. They were certainly a second tier. Uh, studio that wanted to become a first tier studio. And when Harry Warner saw the Bell Laboratories demonstration of Vitaphone in 1925, uh, and it had talking and it had music and so on, but what he was hearing was beautifully electrically recorded sound, which most people had never heard before because they had these old acoustic phonographs and so on. And it was him who said, um, you know, who the hell wants to hear actors talk? So it was really the idea that, and they were able to get the banks to, to front a tremendous amount of money. It was, again, that idea of providing theaters with full music and sound effects soundtracks so they could fire their musicians. So it's like that was really the impetus to really get the funding from the banks, from, uh, from Morgan Stanley and, uh, and, and the other big banks. Um, and their thought was, even if they just did that, they were going to do very well financially. And of course, the audiences had different ideas about talking in pictures. That's fascinating. That's fascinating insight because it's something that you wouldn't think of normally. But obviously, putting the, just the music on the discs would have co been a cost savings to the studio in terms of producing production costs. Oh, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Ron, what is your take on the Jazz Singer trailer? It, well, the Jazz Singer trailer, which uh, probably everybody's seen with John Milgen. Uh, I've heard different stories that John Milgen was drunk when he did it. He looks terrified. <laughs> he looks and completely I terrified, terrified in, in that trailer. I think, I think he's just nervous, out of control and nervous. And uh, I think that's all it was. I mean, here, here, this is the first talking trailer. Nobody else had ever done it. He was, he was a silent film actor. I mean, so this was new to him. Uh, it was going to have incredibly high visibility because the jazz singer was the premier uh, attraction as theaters were wired for sound. So it was going to be seen everywhere. I, I don't think he was drunk. I think he was just incredibly nervous. Um, you know, he, there were no cue cards or anything. So on top of being nervous on, with the technology, he had to remember all of his lines. Keep in mind, he's speaking on the disc while they were later going to cut in. Uh, those different pictures of the crowds, uh, you know, going to, to see the jazz singer and so on. I think he was just nervous with the incredible technology and visibility. So so what was the purpose for that trailer? Because obviously the premiere had already happened. Um, did that film, did that trailer run after other sound pictures, early sound pictures? Or uh, if, if the theater wasn't wired for sound, how could they show a trailer for the jazz singer with sound? 
Good question. Well, here here's a story. Imagine Jazz Singer came out in uh, October of 1927. Relatively few theaters. Sam is really taking taking over, and theaters by the hundreds and then thousands during 1928 are being wired. Keep in mind, Warner Brothers was, was, was issuing virtually all of their silent films, all the silent features, with a Vitaphone music and sound effect track. So if a theater got wired for sound, let's say in March of 1928, they were able to, before, before they showed The Jazz Singer, they were able to show these many shorts and the silent synchronized features, and they could show the coming attraction trailer with John Milgen. So in other words, you know, it could be that they're going to show The Jazz Singer in May. Uh, so as theaters got wired for sound, they were able to show all of these probably over 100 features that Warner Brothers did with music and sound effects. And, and the shorts, the many, many shorts, vaudeville and operatic and comedy shorts and so on. And they would have shown that trailer. And that would have been obviously a big event um, when they showed the jazz singer, uh, you know, shortly after the theater opened with uh, being wired for sound. There was a trailer made for The Singing Fool, uh, sort of on the same lines of The Jazz Singer, but Jolson himself uh, actually narrated it. That is that is still considered lost, correct? Correct, yes. The visuals and the uh, audio. Both, bo yeah, both elements is right now are missing, yeah. Okay. Yeah. One thing I uh, we mentioned uh, earlier, and this kind of shows where, you know, when we started the Vitaphone project, yeah, we're interested in Vitaphone, but that doesn't mean I don't hear from people who have other early talkie related things and um, nor do we want to limit things to, uh, to, to oh, bite a phone and Warner Brothers only. So what's happened uh, over the years is we've been very fortunate to be involved with assisting on many, many other restorations. And a little earlier today, uh, the King of Jazz was mentioned and the King of Jazz was a 1930 all Technicolor Paul Whiteman feature which is circulated around for years on VHS in a very washed out, almost pastel looking, uh, poor quality, technicolor looking, kind of looking print. Mm -hmm. So uh, fortunately, uh, Universal, which now owns uh, the film, has uh, had initiated last year a restoration after finding a beautiful, vivid, very fragile 35 millimeter nitrate technicolor print. Minus the sound, which means that we, we were able to help find a lot of the soundtrack discs that they needed um, and so on. And that actually is going to be coming out sometime later this year from Universal. Wow. So even though it wasn't a Vitaphone film, there was a soundtrack effect. Uh, another film that was long thought to be lost for about 80 years was the Three Stooges' uh, only lost film called Hello Pop, which was a two-reel MGM 1933 Technicolor uh, again, uh, uh, sh comedy short. And uh, about four years ago, a guy in Australia where many American films are rediscovered because stuff would go there and it was too expensive to ship it back to Hollywood. He said, I think I have a film that may be thought to be lost. And he mentioned Hello Pop. And uh, he was right. And my role, among other things, is to really put together the owners of the film. In this case, again, was Warner Brothers with the collector, make a reasonable uh, accommodation for them repatriate the film, get it restored in a reasonable amount of time and get it seen again. And we were able to do that. So there's a lot of cases that we go beyond the, the boundaries of pure Vitaphone on early sound restorations. And of course, we're thrilled to be able to do that. Are these studios, when you, when you reach out to the studio about uh, something that's found and needs to be restored and properly released, do the studios seem excited about it? Or are they, are a lot of them nowadays don't act like they could, care too much about any of its history well when when we started the vifone project in 91 um uh, the bottom line was a, a lot of collectors then figured well i have these discs is the studio going to try to take them from me because they're not my property i mean people remember uh, film collectors being raided by the fbi in the 50s and 60s i guess and that was in the minds of a lot of collectors so i have to say warner mm -hmm. Bros. at the time was the most enlightened of all the studios in that they said, not only will we just borrow the disc, use it, uh, but we will give the loaner uh, a personal copy of the restoration of the film. They can't sell it, but they, they would have it. They will get on-screen credit. And that would, that's, uh, that's something that today, the only other studio that really does that and has become enlightened is now Universal, which has really drastically upgraded their restoration team. 
uh, and is doing the the uh, King of Jazz. They're doing all the Marx Brothers Paramounts, some silent films, and so on. Now, so I would say those two studios we primarily deal with. I will hear from them. I'll hear from Ned Price, the chief preservation officer of Warner Brothers, and he'll say, "Ron, do you know where any discs for such and such a film are?" Wow. I mean, so it's really a a really open relationship very supportive of each other. There isn't any kind of, uh, you know, uh, overly protective uh, uh, kind of uh, stance at all. So the other studios are kind of okay, but they're certainly not in the same league as Warner Brothers and, and now Universal. Was Warner Brothers at all uh, concerned when they put the jazz singer back on on DVD about the, the blackface issue? Because, I mean, you look at the cover and it's all, you know, silhouetted and and they had to put that disclaimer inside the, the, the original program saying how they, it doesn't represent Warner Brothers and it's it's an artifact of its time, this, that, and the other. They seem real concerned about uh, backlash about that. Well, I, I was, when we say they, I mean, I think what we're, we're, I think we know we're saying is the lawyers. <laughs> we're, we're kind of, <laughs> the film preservationists. And again, to give credit to George Feltenstein, who is the one who did those wonderful laser disc box sets of the of the 90s with all the shorts and and stuff um who who loves film knows film uh i think it would be safe to say that he fought a major uphill battle to preserve the film and to put it out again and uh it was truly an uphill battle and um you know it's my understanding that some of the lawyers at the, at the studio had the feeling that, well, uh, you know, we can't put out anything with somebody in blackface. And George, God bless him, knows film better than any of us, all of us combined on this call. Uh, I said, well, you know, how about Mickey Rooney, Eddie Canner, Fred Astaire, Judy Garland? And he ticked off like 40 names of, of people who are in, already in films that MGM or Warner Brothers owns that they, they put out already. Um, so it was not, it was not easy. And one of the interesting things about that set was that... He decided, along with uh, kind of my encouragement, to, to say the least, to include the first time on DVD restored Vitaphone shorts. And the idea was that if the DVD set did well, it was probably as much for the shorts, which people would be able to see for the first time on DVD, as for the jazz singer, which was had generally been out there, albeit not on the restored version. And that set was the biggest selling black and white DVD uh, set out for that year. So in other words, it didn't kind of just do okay. It did phenomenally well. And that's what's encouraged Warner Archive to put out almost 200 more shorts uh, in various sets on their Warner Archive DVD sets. Wow. So once again, the jazz singer was kind of the spearhead uh, uh, project that got all the other Vitaphone stuff taken, look, taken a more serious look at. That's really cool. Absolutely. That's yep. really cool. So Warner Brothers initially wasn't interested in even ever revisiting the jazz singer really ever again. Or so it was pretty much the uh, you guys and the restoration team that said, you you know, you need to put this out, um, you know, in the DVD era, now the Blu-ray era. But uh, this is a movie that needs to be represented in a, a modern format. And, and yeah, they, and they didn't seem like too into it at the time. You had to kind of sell it on them. Well, I, I didn't have to sell George. George was the, was the spearhead on this whole thing, as he always is, and he's willing willing to really fight for what he believes is was the right thing to do. And of course, he was proven proven right. And an interesting story about that: the the set got very very good reviews, except from a writer at Entertainment Weekly. And a friend of mine was at a dinner party. Uh, shortly after the Jazz Singer DVD set came out. And he's sitting with some people he knew and some people he didn't. And they had maybe a table of 12 or 14 people having dinner. And he's a big fan of the Jazz Singer, of what Warner Brothers did in re releasing it and everything. And he had just read this ridiculous article, a review from uh, a, a writer at the uh, Entertainment Weekly, basically saying, it's shameful that you put out this film with blackface. These films should just be destroyed. Why are we looking at this again? And he's just saying, what an idiot. What kind of an idiot who is clueless, supposedly writing for an entertainment magazine, would even say this? And other people are jumping on, they're saying, yeah, what a jerk. You know, what, what kind of an idiot would do this? And the guy sitting next to him said, uh, I wrote that article. <laughs> 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 and they, just, they reamed him. 
And they <laughs> said, you owe George Feltenstein and Ron Hutchinson an apology. And what kind of a dummy, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I've done a few introductions of the jazz singer and in a couple of venues, they wanted me to put everything in context. But let me tell you, the bottom line is people coming to see the film know the context. They don't, you don't need a lot of defending. You know, you could say something tacit about it's a film of its time and that's how things were at the time or whatever. But nobody's thinking anybody's promoting any kind of hatred or anything. That's just the way it was at the time. Yeah. Yeah, all it takes is a little bit of an open mind to understand that, that you know, the maybe the politically correct atmosphere that we have today is maybe a little bit too sensitive. Maybe yeah. just look at this as an artifact, as the yeah. artifact that it is. Unfortunately, yeah. it seems that none of the people are able to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, any any more questions before we wrap it up? I have I have a last one, which okay. is quite a, it's in addition to what I said before about the pro professors in Germany, film professors in Germany who do not really consider Jolson to be, to have been that important in the, you know, in terms of uh, the development of talking pictures and everything. Uh, I have a film professor who actually has to take my oral exams and he hates Jolson and Jolson <laughs> is my, one, of, one of my topics. So I have to get prepared to guard myself against his arguments. Um, and he, one of his biggest arguments, is, uh, I think, is that he says that, well, the jazz singer was not an all talking. I think that's pretty much his main concern. So it's like most, most of it is, is a silent film. So I tend to say then that, um, it's the first feature with dialogue. Is that correct? Yeah, it's the first uh, feature, successful feature. Uh, I mean, there were attempts. Uh, I think there was a D.W. Griffith silent that he did an opening prologue to, but that's not really in the body of the film. So it was the first feature uh, okay. that incorporated synchronized sound and of and all, uh, of all kinds, singing, music, and so on. So it was really that right. was really the first one. So that's certainly. Uh, you know, speaks volumes as to uh, its importance in film history. Right. And and what would you uh, consider to be the first uh, all talking? Would that be Lights of New York, nineteen twenty eight? Yeah. The, the, fir the, fir the first the uh, first all talking feature. Uh, in other words, it was there was dialogue throughout the entire thing, synchronized throughout the whole thing. W was uh, uh, Lights of New York, um, nineteen twenty eight, which started out as a short and just kept growing and growing. Uh, it cost, I believe, $23,000, and it was the most uh, profitable, if you look at what you spent versus what you made, I think made $1.4 million. <laughs> so oh, first what a profit. talking film, uh, and it was advertised as that. I mean, I have one of the posters. So in other words, they weren't hiding that fact at all from the audience that it was the first all talking film. It's not a very good film, but that didn't right. matter. It just mattered that you had the, the novelty of all talking. Uh, even into the early 30s, I think films that were, that were all talking were advertised as such, right? This is an all talking fi picture, even though sound had been, yep. uh, it, it had, it had existed for maybe four or five years. It was yeah. still a novelty to be an all talking film, yeah. even as yeah, late as the early much, 30s, right? Uh, yeah, pretty much through 1930, uh, you would very often see, uh, like a Laurel Hardy shorts, even it'll say uh, uh, an all talking uh, comedy or, or picture or whatever like that. And then, uh, you know, eventually that faded because that was the norm. They were just the norm, right. silence anymore. Yeah. Right. And that famous interview, well, staged interview with Jolson and a reporter to promote Mammy in 1930. Jolson yeah. stresses very, very uh, exuberantly that it's an all talking picture. So, yeah. So 1930 was still a draw to audiences that it was all talking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ron, you want to go ahead and plug, uh, I, I think we might have done it earlier, but for anyone who's not uh, familiar with Ron, uh, where can they reach out to you in the Vitaphone project? Okay. Yeah, there's a, there's certainly a few places. First of all, we do have a website that has our last 25 years of newsletters and our each new newsletter. We have uh, uh, twice a year come out and we talk about discoveries and new releases on DVD and so on. Uh, lots of news on people and, and so on. And that's at www.vitaphoneproject.com. We also have a, a wonderful Facebook page uh, you can find just by going to Vitaphone Project. And uh, lots of pictures, recordings, uh, reminiscences, questions, and so on. Uh, and then certainly, maybe most importantly, if anybody happens to find any of those big 16-inch shellac discs <laughs> and they think they have soundtrack discs, they can certainly email me at ron, R-O-N, at vitaphoneproject.com. Cool, cool. And let, let's hope there, there are some that uh, uh, are still out there underneath beds and in attics and uh, in basements <laughs> somewhere. 
Yeah. It, you, you know what? What what makes me laugh is that uh, obviously the Vita, the Plantation Act disc got uh, broke. Somebody decided. Yeah, I'm going to try to fix this myself with, what was it, epoxy or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, yeah. It, it just makes you wonder, like, maybe what year that was where it got broken and somebody tried to, to fix it. I wonder if they tried to put it on a turn, what kind of turntable they tried to use to play it back on <laughs> in their in their home or whatever. You would have said, you would have said oops, because it wouldn't have played. Yeah. When, we heard, when we first heard uh, the disc before they fixed it, I mean, it wouldn't go a fifth of a second without skipping. I wow. mean, so you, you couldn't even, you could barely make out a single word, but you could tell it was Jolson. <laughs> and now, you could tell you to spend the time on it, you know? Uh, but it's a good thing someone did try to fix it, right? Instead of just d ditch it all together because it exactly. would have been lost forever. Yeah, because you, there has not been another copy found in, in the ensuing 20 years. It's amazing that after they fix it, realizing they botched it up completely and they still didn't toss it. So that that's kind of yeah. like a, a sign of <laughs> destiny, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What do you think of the new technology of uh, reading grooves digitally with with uh, lasers? Uh, I mean, I mean uh, if the Jazz Singer, I'm sorry, if the Plantation Act record was found today, I would imagine that's how they would transfer it over. Because I know some of those old Thomas Edison uh, wax cylinders that they had inside the, the the creepy Edison dolls that were never they were so fragile they were, they were never able to play them today they actually use a laser technology now to read the digital technology to read the grooves and and simulate uh what was on the record so i can imagine as the years go by and, and that kind of technology gets more more prominent you know you wouldn't even have to touch the record or put a needle on it to to archive the, the sound on it yeah well, well, it's funny you should mention this. Uh, usually, I mean, if the if the grooves are trackable, uh, still right now, at least the best way to get the most sound out of the grooves is to use the needle. However, um, uh, a case came up uh, on a project that I was assisting the Library of Congress on two weeks ago, and it was for a Technicolor short called uh, Princess Ladybug. And it happens to be a Technicolor short, and I, I I happen to have, and I checked on my database, I had the disc. So the folks down there who I've worked with on a bunch of other shorts restorations said, well, yeah, could you could you send me the disc? And I got the disc maybe 10 years ago. Well, I'm looking high and low in my collection. Where is this thing? If I had it in my database, I know I have it. Well, guess what? I finally, the light bulb went on, and I have a small stack on the bottom of the shelf of discs that have broken, that have pieces missing, or whatever that I don't have the heart to throw out. And I pull this out and imagine a disc that has about a uh, three inch V at the top and it goes down to the hole in the, in the disc missing. And mm -hmm. I can't find the missing piece. So I said, I'm sorry, you know, I guess we can't do this. And they said, well, you know what? Ship it down anyway. They're gonna try to use that technology, which means I guess that when they put it on the turntable, it's going to have to jump over this little gap, not so little gap, where there's nothing, there's no shellac whatsoever, and see if they can do it. Because you can't do it with a needle, obviously, it's going to have to, it's like jumping over a gorge, you know. So uh, it, this is going to definitely have a place at least to try. Whether it's successful or not, I don't know. But that, you could. this is the only technology you could use for a disc that's actually missing a portion of the shellac. Wow. It's amazing how the technology of, of, of you know, today and the future assists in bringing the old technology back to, to life. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. All right, Ron. Well, thank you very, very much. It's been a uh, very enlightening, very wonderful conversation we had with you. And, and thanks also for sticking with us through all our Skype issues we had initially. My, my pleasure. I'm a Skype expert now. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, all for, right. thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. No problem. I hope, hope to talk to you soon. Thanks again. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 All right, guys. That was fantastic. Oh, awesome. Oh, yeah. I, I, uh, time went by so fast. It yeah, did. What, what, I, what, I got an education. I'll tell you that. He's a wealth of knowledge. Yes. And uh, like I said, I, I, I joked about it earlier. I said, we're going to end up doing a two-hour episode about an eight-minute short film. <laughs> but, getting close. Exactly. It's getting close. Yeah. An hour and a half. Well, I, I didn't initially um, um, think about talking about the jazz singer, but as the, the, the conversation progressed, it, it just made sense. Just, why don't we just talk about the yeah. jazz singer and, uh, and all that stuff, too? Because you it, know, all, you can, it all you know, follows each other naturally, all the topics. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you again for listening to this uh, episode, and we'll see you next time on Wild About Jolson.